Okay, we're, uh, we're down on just start number 12 today, but I'm just going to go back to the last, uh, where we ended up last week for the second or two year or another two. There were a bunch of quotations here, and it was to do with the, where we were ending up here on this last paragraph, uh, the reaping accomplished uh, Jerusalem and the land feared strangers. And it talked about the little horn of the goat, uh, the king of fierce countenance, broken without hand, and the image of Nebuchadnezzar, and it quoted a, a number of quotations here, and I just, we just kind of breezed over these, we're just kind of finishing up this paragraph. Is everybody familiar with what the little horn of the goat is, and how that works in, and what that prophecy was all about? There was a quotation from, um, well, first of all, Daniel 11:45, and we did look at them, but we really didn't comment very much about it. And of course, this prophecy from Daniel 11 is about the King of the North. Um, you know, looking at first, well, it goes back quite a ways, but it talks about the King of the North, and the King will do according to his will, and. Verse 38, uh, thus shall he do in the most strongholds of the strange God. And uh, then he shall enter into the glorious land. He shall stretch forth his hand both upon the countries. And I think we we kind of get that. Uh, you know, the king of the south shall push at him. The king of the north shall come against him. It's, it's speaking about what we've already been talking about in the time of the end. The king of the north um, is... I guess migrates from what it used to refer to as the uh, the area of uh, coal Syria, and uh, you know when it was pushing back and forth between that and, and Egypt to the constant conflict between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. And uh, at the time of the end, of course, that is that that symbol of the King of the North kind of migrates to the to encompass the uh, Gog and, and the affiliates that come down. Yeah. Is that Syria the same Syria, the same area, the same people as today? Basically, yeah. Well, that's the yeah. world at all right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Once again. Yeah. And uh, anyway, and, and it talks about all this, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, which uh, we just have been speaking about, where you know, they hear tidings out of the north and out of the east, and they go up to Jerusalem, they plant their, plant their you know, they take over and, and put their base there, and uh, are routed in, in course of time. So that's kind of that prophecy from Daniel 11:45, and then there was the other one from Daniel chapter 8, verse 9, and again, we need connection here, and if you go back to it talks about the he goat. Um, this is about the ram, the he goat, and the he goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now, does anybody have any idea what what that symbol is speaking of? Alexander. Alexander, right? Before that was the he goat. Yeah, Alexander, and and uh, there was four. Uh, you know, when when his Time was over. Uh, in his place, there were four generals that, that sort of took over in place of Alexander, and that was the four notable horns. Um, we can just look at that really quickly here. Um, the four notable ones following Alexander's death, his empire was divided up between four generals of his army. Uh, Lysimachus ruled over part of Thrace, Asia Minor, part of Cappadocia, and the countries within the limits of Mount Taurus. Cassander possessed Macedonia, that was the other one, the second one, Cassander. He possessed Macedonia, Thessaly, and part of Greece. Ptolemy mm -hmm. obtained Egypt, Cyprus, Cyrene. And this is just goes right into what we're talking about. The, and, and Ptolemy uh, uh, 
course, and then you have Seleucus, uh, which was the... These two became the, like the king of the south, the king of the north. And he obtained Phoenicia, Syria, Babylonia, to the Indus. So of these four horns or powers, that is Syria and Egypt. Uh, Syria, Seleucia, and Egypt, the Ptolemy, as directly affecting the Holy Land, are described in detail in the prophecy of Daniel 11, which we just looked at. So that's, uh, that kind of describes that. And then out of one of them, out of one of them, out of one of those horns, came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And what was that referring to? Well, yeah, and, and, and Rome, actually. Like Rome and, uh, and uh, you know, and it, as it goes down, it, it kind of works into the, the Rome, the Holy Roman Empire, the papacy, and everything that was involved with that. Yeah? Oh, okay. You know, um, because out of one of them, which I believe was Macedonia, is where the strength that where Rome kind of uh, came from. Um, the little horns that grew of the goat grew out of one of the four horns that appeared following the breaking of the notable horn. And this horn is described in similar terms to that of Daniel 7, verse 8, but like the eyes and mouth of a man that designated the little horn of the beast. So that was more towards the Pope. That was the focus of the Pope. The focus of this is the, just the, the empire, the Roman Empire itself. Um, the eyes and the mouth of that horn showed it to be ecclesiastical in nature, whereas this horn is military in constitution. The two little horns of Daniel's prophecies, therefore, are different aspects of one power, the western and eastern divisions of the Roman Empire, whereas the image of Daniel 2 illustrated that Rome would be divided into two parts, these prophecies symbolize their different characters. The little horn of this chapter developed out of the principality of Pergamos, often ignored by historians when traveling within with the events relating to the dividing up of Alexander's realm. Attalus, first of Pergamum, together with Thrace and Byzantium, became allied to Rome, which drew the growing empire of that city more directly into the east. Attalus III created his kingdom to Rome, which subsequently annexed it. It could be properly claimed, therefore, that the power of Rome in the east grew out of the little horn of the goat. So Pergamos and Macedonia, that whole area of that, uh, I believe, was Cassandra. Sure. I'm not sure if I've got this quite right, but uh, in the beginning, the eastern, the Constantinople side of the Roman Empire actually gave power to Rome, mm -hmm. or, or sustained them in yeah. power. Yeah, we're actually talking about long before that, really, so yes. this, is, this is before Christ. This is where the, kind of okay. the roots of the Roman Empire, where they grew up. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we're, we're still talking about the time period you're, you're speaking of, but that, that it, yeah, it yeah, comprehends a, a long period, and what he's talking about here is, is where it grew out of, you know, where the, it grew out of one of these horns. And, of course, developed into everything that, and more than what you're speaking of. Yeah. So that's uh, you know, verse 23 and 25 of that eighth chapter. The latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And that's where we get into the, the later development of it, um, where Rome develops into a, a superpower. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy wonderfully. And through his policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. He shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. And I believe, you know, we'll just take a quick, quick look at that. So, um, in the latter time of the kingdom, we've already looked at that. The king of fierce countenance. This describes the warlike aspect of Rome and ruthlessness of the legions that extended its power. It is a title that Moses used to describe the nation that would scatter Jewry so that Daniel would have been familiar with it. Moses prophetically declared, Yahweh shall bring a nation against thee from afar. 
Roland was at the western extremity of the then known world as far as Yuri was concerned, as swift as the eagle flyeth, uh, the flying eagle, of course, a symbol of Rome, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. In structure and idiom, Latin is completely foreign to the Hebrews. A nation of fierce or warlike confidence, he shall besiege thee in all thy gates. And the understanding of dark sentences, Rodan renders this a skillful, skillful in dissimulation. Rome's cunning diplomacy, its ability to camouflage its real intentions, was brought to its peak by Augustus, that was BC 63 to AD 4, talks about him in Luke 2, verse 1. He gained the confidence of the people and changed the constitution. According to Gibbon, in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, his dissimulation brought about such a change in the constitution of the empire as to weaken its foundation and lead to its decline and fall. Rome perfected the policy of dividing and conquering the nations it wished to overcome. This was particularly the case in Palestine. It gained control of that area without war. Augustus used Herod to his own ends, undermining and dividing Jerusalem. So by so doing, he won Palestine by diplomacy and a policy of cunning, and so fulfilled the prophecy of Daniel. And he stood out to suggest supreme control, such as Rome exercised over the dominions that that it ruled. And uh, just finally here in this verse um, talks about craft. He shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. The word craft is from the Hebrew merma, signifying deceit or fraud. The revised version renders this word as deceit. Jeremiah 9 and 6, the word is used in relation to false religious teaching and is appropriate here for the power referred to is described as casting down the truth to the ground, verse 12. This had been characteristic of those reigning in Constantinople throughout the centuries from the time of Constantine onwards. So it talks here of the development of the Roman Catholic Church being directly traceable to the influence of the emperors of Constantinople such as Justinian and Popus. It was their support that gave the Pope his authority and power. And it goes on to talk about how that developed into the the Holy Roman Empire, um, and so on. I don't want to go into a long dialogue on here, but um, it just it basically just describes the the history of how that whole development has progressed. Jordan? I think it was a comment on uh, verse 23 mm-hmm. that mentioned about uh, Rome being the uh, extent uh, to which the uh, jury right. knew about mm-hmm. and that that really explains you know because there were there was China and different other civilizations going on but when the Bible talks it's talking from the perspective of the Jews because you know God chose yeah. them to reveal his purpose through so that that's why these other uh, entities are not mentioned in the Bible at all because they're just kind of outside of the focus of yeah they didn't impact on much on the history of the Jews or the development of the almost zero you mm-hmm. might say yeah. that yeah. it's true so anyway I just thought I would go in and of course this, this last one is you know what that one is it talks about the stone being cut without hands and smoked the image upon his feet that were our fire and clay and break into pieces. That was kind of the, the ultimate end and that's really what that whole paragraph that, that uh, we ended up with was, was talking about. So I just thought I would just touch on that because it's kind of important to get that. We didn't really have time to do that last week. Yeah. It's the day. Uh, heavenly Catholic that live in theory or is that modern Catholic a mixture? You know, I, I I would venture to say it's mostly Muslim, but uh, there's probably a, a mixture there. I, but I don't know. I really can't speak to that. Anybody else have the stats on that? Gordon? I think the point is that they are allied with that northern connection which is allied with 
believes it is about to collapse, they will do everything in their power to bring Israel down as well. Uh, Daniel 11 and 40 speaks of the king of the south pushing at the king of the north. The ancient king of the north was Syrian. As we see America and Britain pushing Russia over Syria and trying to force them to accept the UN agreement, we may be witnessing the push, a provocation. Events are moving towards Russia having hooks put in its jaws and being forced to enter militarily into the Middle East and down into Israel. And of course, any quotes on that 40th verse, which we've just been speaking about, really. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So, and of course, the hymns so he refers to the king of the north. So, Russia. So it's uh, you know it's, it's a fitting uh, introduction to to uh, you know I'll be considering here in the next section. Of the I was thinking, can you imagine Brother Thomas was right today? Or yeah, today? Be jumping up and down. It's so so uh, further on with uh, with this, and we. have we're basically dealing with the same um, the same passages here. Uh, just going on a little bit further, and talking about the one holding the, the sickle, and uh, we're just proceeding on now from verse 17 through verse 20. This section will deal, I think, with uh, verse 17 and 18. And another angel it says came out of the temple. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice, with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sickle, thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So we'll just take a quick look at our some of the things from the expositor here that just to give us a bit of a lead in and he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped so he says harvest here suggests grain in comparison with the vintage of verse 18 you now verse 18 speaks about another angel which came uh, out from the altar and is saying to thrust in that sharp sickle gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe so that's um, in contrast with verse 16 here, you see. As grain ripens before the grapes, so Armageddon will precede the invasion of Europe by Christ's forces in order to overthrow Babylon the Great. Uh, Revelation 17 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords, the King of kings. They that are with him are called the chosen and faithful. But these there, of course, are the those of the ten horns, the ten kings. They um, symbolize today or typified today, fulfilled today by the European Union alliance. So that's uh, verse 16, verse 17. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. In this verse, the temple is represented as being in heaven, <clears throat> suggesting that the temple of living stones, the glorified redeemed, are now in power, established as the government of Jerusalem. The emergence of this angel is equivalent to the proclamation of the warning of verses 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth of every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that has made heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountain, the fountains of waters. 
and uh, verse 18, and another angel came up from the altar. So how many uh, how many angels is this so far? Three. It's, it's two in what we're reading about, but how many in the chapter? I, yeah, at least at least three that are spoken of. Uh, well, it'll be four because I think fifteen speaks of another angel, so it'll be more than more than three. Don. Why would <coughs> that verse eighteen be left out of this? Um, yeah, it goes seventeen, nineteen, twenty. Eighteen is here. Where? Second one that right in line with the seventeen. Oh, I see. I know that thought about. Everybody got their verses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm missing it. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, another angel came off from the altar, and these various angels are all symbolic of the saints in different aspects, either predicting, warning, or executing judgments. So very, very important thing here to basic thing to think about. All of these are symbolic of the saints. But just in different phases, different aspects, different stages. Christ is the altar. Hebrews uh, 13 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat but serve the tabernacle. And that is Christ. And the angel is represented as emerging therefrom in answer to the prayers of Revelation 6 and 9 though uttered so long ago. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So that kind of sets the, the base for this angel coming from the altar. And uh, it says, He had power over fire. The altar fire is divine fire, capable of consuming the wicked. Uh, Leviticus 9.24 And there came a fire out from before the Lord consumed upon the altar of the burnt offering and the fat which when all the people saw they shouted and fell on their faces and was capable of consuming the wicked. Verse, look at verse 2 of chapter 10 of Leviticus And they went out a fire from the Lord and devoured them. That's Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, the ones that took strange incense and devoured them, and they died before Yahweh. And uh, the angel cries with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. The word gather is true from true, to gather the ripe fruit in autumn, and you know, it's the gathering in of the ripe and harvest, vintage or ripe fruits. And for her grapes are fully ripe, here the word is agnizo, to the full point of ripeness. From this Greek word is derived the English word agno. Uh, whereas the harvesting of grain in verse 15 represents the judgment of Armageddon, the gathering in of the vintage symbolizes the conquest of Europe and the world, which falls upon the destruction of Go, and of course inter- intervene between uh, with the, uh, the Mid-Heaven Proclamation. And uh, I think verse 19 is also applicable to this. The angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth. There are both Jewish and Gentile vines. The reference here is to the latter, to Gentile nations. And uh, as I see in Isaiah 63 and 3, I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none to help me, but none with me. For I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. And Revelation 19, 11 to 16, saw heaven open, behold a white horse, he that sat upon him faithful and true, is called, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was full of the best dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goes a sharp, and out of his mouth, uh, sorry, let's hit the wrong button here, 
and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. So that's the basically the the, um, you know, the the point that's being brought out by the quoting these verses that it is the nations that would be smitten, the Gentile nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So the context is the same, talking about the winepress and the treading of it, and it is the nations that are the subject of that, the Gentile nations. And cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The adjective is in the masculine gender, the noun in the feminine. There will be a joint labor by the bridegroom and the bride. Beatrice. I was just thinking the way things are going right now. It can't be Armageddon yet because we're still here. When Armageddon comes, the judgment is passed, right? Yeah. Day of Armageddon. Yeah. So there might, somebody might drop a match and there'll be a skirmish, but it's not Armageddon. We'll know when this one happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there any meaning behind the fact that in these verses it talks about a sharp sickle, whereas in 15 it's just a sickle? Um, between the so being it, one being sharp and one being not sharp. Yeah. I believe so. I think we'll. we'll, we'll yeah, I think we'll get there. We'll try to keep remember that question. But there are references that this field there where it says how long the Lord is us not avenge the blood of the saints. That's actually good a theme through scripture I know in the prophets and in the Psalms yeah. and has very similar quotes. Right. And that kind of brings makes the connection between what we quoted in verse six about the souls under the altar and you know, which is a long time ago. And what is uh prophet that happened here and that that makes the connection. That's a theme that runs through. The hearing of the bride and wing. Yeah. Um, well, just a quick question. I wonder if we can point that out on this chart. This sure. little chart up front here. It's kind of nice to to increase that a little bit. You yeah. know, this time period. Yeah. Well, we're really right up um, right up in where where the lines end here. And, in the 6th and 7th vial. Yeah. The 6th uh, six, six vial is here. Yeah. And the uh, 7th vial is this one. Of course, we extend extended that from where the chart it ends a little bit. Where in the 6th? More like, yeah. Because it's all at the point we're reading now. Yeah. Okay. But it only yeah, it yeah. actually goes, yeah, yeah. it overlaps the 7th. And, uh, you know, this should actually be extended a bit now, too. Because this is 1900 here, and so 2000 is up above here. If we were to uh, draw another line there, so vials in that Christ determined. Yeah, that's again like the seventh trumpet, seventh seal, yeah, and vision. And it contains the seven hundreds, which we oh, have here, which is the yeah, yeah the present. Yeah. yeah, this chart's based on Brother Thomas's. Dating, which Indeed. is suggested, yeah. of course. But yeah, yeah, we just got to extend lines. Yeah, it's all still valid. We just extend the lines. Okay, so, um, oh, sit, I'm sorry. You were gonna, yeah. I'm just trying to do the work on Don's question there, and, and um, uh, it's uh, very brief and, and uh, probably includes a little bit of guesswork, but uh, sharp is a word that was applied to the Word of God. It's quick and sharper than any two-edged sword to the dividing of the sunder of soul and spirit. Um, so I would expect that sharp has reference to the mode uh, in which this, the way in this, which this was done. And I'd have to do a little bit of, of work, uh, like the original word for sharp is keen or sharp and swift. Uh, now compare the two uh, references. Um, 
the one is a, is a plain sickle and the other is a sharp sickle and I, I think it may have to do with sort of the the, the attitude or the, um, the the demeanor of the action in other words one is is done but it's, things are allowed to develop a little more whereas the sharp sickle it's like here and now there's no uh, there's no uh, waiting, no time. This is going to happen, and it's going to happen now. It's the, the the time is determined, and it's here. Uh, you know that would be my guess, but I, it's a guess, sort of a indicative one. Yeah, it's kind of indicative of increasing uh, in stages, increasing in intensity. Yeah. Uh, the the angel that comes uh, from the out of the temple in verse uh, fifteen. Is um, is symbolic of of the uh, the saints as they emerge from the judgment seat and go forward, and there is a there is a, a conquest that happens at that time, um, and then they proceed. The other angel that comes forth in verse 17 is, is the Armageddon angel, and that is a higher intensity judgment that would take place. You just kind of think about, you know, somebody say in Africa or whatever that would be using a sickle. Yeah. And uh, they, the harvest is coming ready. And they pull that sickle out and they start cutting their crop and they're going like, the sickle isn't cutting fast enough. There's lots to do here and we need it done right now. Let's take it back to the bench and sharpen it. So now it will, it will right. execute the job yeah. without delay. And the angel in verse 15 is the one that, uh, as I said, it's, it's before they're based, they have their seat of authority based. And uh, the temple is symbolic of the saints there. Whereas the uh, later, the temple is shown in heaven or the place of authority. And that's where then the edict goes forth to go with the sharp sickle to harvest. So, again, I, I don't know if this is right, but it seems to indicate that. Uh, well, they have a greater base, uh, greater authority, even, and, and uh, are more um, visible to the nations around, and the proclamation then goes out to submit or be subject to the sharp signal. I think we'll, we'll cover more of that as, as we go on. Uh, I think that's sort of the, the idea there. So we've got the, um, the paragraphs here. There's nine of them, and uh, we we'll just briefly look at them here. Uh, paragraph one talks about the one who holds the sickle he is the symbolic son of man, the rainbow angel, Christ and the saints. That seems to be a common denominator throughout all of these uh, symbolic angels appearing here. Uh, paragraph two. Uh, talks about two different sickling executives identified. Uh, in effect, the same agency, but different time period. Number three, speaks about the relationship between the first and last phases of the Armageddon battle. Paragraph four talks about the slaying of Daniel's fourth beast and the destruction of his body are the same two phases, being the first phase is the slaying of the beast and the second phase being the destruction of the body. Uh, paragraph 5 talks about the mid heaven proclamation being sandwiched between those two phases. Paragraph 6 brings us to another phase, the angel of the altar, the avenger of the blood beneath it. Paragraph 7 the angel of the altar calls upon the angel of the sickle to administer the avenging. Paragraph 8 defines some symbols. Uh, the line of the earth, the grapes and the clusters, the wine press of the wrath of David defines some symbols for us. And paragraph 9 uh, speaks about the sickle being the remnant of Jacob. In other words, the sickle angel uses the, the remnant of Jacob to respond to the outcry of the altar angel. Oh, 
paragraph 1, the one who holds the sickle is the symbolic son of man, the rainbow angel. It says, then another angel came out of the nave. This is the same form of expression as in the 15th verse. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Trust in my sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. <coughs> the word another in verse 15 implies that the one sitting upon the cloud was an angel. So that would be the, the first one. And I'm just going back to that again, uh, verse 15. Uh, prior to that, in verse 14, it says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat, like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. We do have a sharp sickle in reference to the one sitting on the cloud. Gordon? Wondering if the uh, doesn't have a, a reference to the holder of the sickle being, uh, you know, being uh, immortal and having complete discernment mm-hmm. sharper than just the blunt judgments that, that the mortal Jews uh, may carry out. I don't know. Just okay. to think about. Okay. So, uh, as we said here, the word another, or as Brother Thomas said, the word another in verse 15 implies that the one sitting upon the cloud was an angel or messenger power also. So, using that, there would be uh, four, the number would be four angels that are brought to our notice here. The angel of the 17th verse is doubtless identical with the symbolic son of man. This is to be inferred from the fact that they both have possession or command of a sharp sickle. So, you know, there's maybe the sharp sickle was close or out and just happens not to be mentioned in verse 15, but it could be the same thing. The power of the sickle is vested in the commander in chief who executes through his officers and brigades the behests of the supreme power. In verse 17, the holder of the sickle is styled an angel and another in relation to the one in the cloud who reaps the harvest because the situation of the sickling and gazetian has changed. There is a difference between the sickling and gazetian of verse 15 and the one of verse 17, is what he's bringing out here. So says there begins in the 15th verse a series of angel symbols. And we probably should say in the 14th verse is where it really begins. Each depicting a phase or a stage of the process of the earth's harvest and a shift from one mode of operation to another. Hence, in that sense, the situation of the sick wing executive has changed. And we'll notice this will this will develop as, as we go forward here and bring out these this is really interesting. Uh, paragraph 2 uh, speaks about two different sickling executives identified. In fact, it's the same agency, but different time period. It says, Thus, a symbolic son of man whose voice is as the sound of many waters sickled the harvest for the purpose of opening a door through which the mighty ones of the Spirit, the Elohim of Israel, might enter in the heaven and set up a throne therein. He refers to chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. After this I looked, and behold, the door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, the voice of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. In this work our labor, they succeeded gloriously. They opened the door, and entered amid the acclamations of people, planted themselves on Mount Zion, and established the throne of the deity before and around which they circled in faultless myriads. But the other angel that sickles the line of the earth comes out of the nave which is in the heaven. The angel power of the harvest and vintage belongs to the nave or temple in most holy manifestation. So it's like the holy and the most holy 
in the tabernacle symbol. But between the advent and the harvest, it is the nave which is not in the heaven, Well, after the harvest and before the vintage, it is the nave which is in the heaven, or the air, where it will continue evermore. So heaven being a symbol of their, their place in, in government and authority. And uh, what he's saying is after they enter the glorious land and plant themselves on Mount Zion, they are the term the nave which is in the heaven. They've got their the base, the, the place where they're meant to be, supposed to be. And so in summary, verse 15, <clears throat> where we, you know, had, that was the subject of the, of the last section, Verse 15 represented the judgment of Armageddon by which the new divine power on the earth is established, after which the gathering in of the vintage symbolizes the conquest of Europe and the world which follows upon the destruction of Gog and, of course, after the Mid-Heaven Proclamation. A couple of verses here we didn't look at. Verse, chapter 14, verse... One, and uh, I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, with 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. In verse 5, in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. I don't think we'll go on any further today. That's pretty much uh, what we got time for. Any questions, read questions, comments? I think that was kind of what John was wondering about, what, what that was about, and uh, um, that's that's what I'm wondering if yeah. it's referring to. Um, there, there is a difference. Of the nation. There is a difference, and that's what's brought out here. The, the verse 15, which is the one that has the sickle, which could still be the sharp sickle. You know, the shows the one in the cloud having the sharp sickle, mm-hmm. and it just says that this. The angel that comes out uh, uh, from the altar and are from the uh, I call that gold here. Yeah, from the altar. From the altar in verse 15 takes that sickle and works judgments with it. So it could still be the sharp sickle, but it is in two different phases. That refers to the Armageddon phase. This refers to after the enthronement in Jerusalem. The judgment on the remaining nations. That's kind of what I'm wondering. Yes. I think that might be the answer, but that's that's what I was. That's kind of what I was. Yeah, that's kind of what I was mentioning before. Is that there's a almost like an increasing intensity of judgment or further development of it. Because the destruction of of the nations, uh, I wouldn't say it'd be indiscriminate, but it's a different thing than. Uh, the differentiation between uh, those that have uh, potential to obey and those that don't. Mm-hmm. I would say, you know, sure. Well, there will be a uh, there will have been a sorting process that will uh, be accomplished. Um, those that after I'm again and then before this uh, takes place there will be a, a sorting process those that, the nations that outright reject Christ I mean it's just okay. 